there, and welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. My name is Lisa Beyer, and I will be your host. So today, we are going to catch up with Laura Martz, and we're going to be talking about three topics, business, booze, and branding. So think about how we can combine those two, how much fun that will be. Every hour seems like it will be a happy hour when you combine business, booze, and branding. But seriously, Laura is brilliant, and she is going to be sharing some takeaways on steps that every business, whether you have a personal brand or a business brand, should take in building their brand. She also is going to have a very generous giveaway, and just in general talking about how she built her business and some do's and don'ts when it comes to branding. So let's take it away with Laura. Hey, everybody. So welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. I am very excited to have Laura Martz here with me. Hey, Laura, how are you? Great. How are you? Good, good. So I'm tuning in today from Celebration, Florida. Where are you located? Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, suburb, suburbs of Milwaukee. You know, I'm living that suburb life now. I'm a new mom, two little ones. So we are out in the burbs. Oh, cool. Well, um, it's a nice place to be for sure, especially during these times and everybody's, you know, working from home and looking for cool places to be hanging out. So it sounds like where you are sounds very nice and inviting. Yeah, I got this amazing at home office set up. So like my husband, you know, has a real job, unlike mine, which we'll get into. Um, So he's working home now because of the whole quarantine COVID situation. And so he kind of gets the the small room. I get my office because I had always been working from home. So it's really not that much different for me. I mean, my normal life was kind of a quarantine situation with the two little babies and working from home. Yeah, same here, same here. So we're here to talk about the importance of branding. But while we're talking about working from home and, you know, kind of we're both on the same wavelength here where we have been working from home before the quarantine, before the pandemic, what are some work from home tips that you can give to those that are not used to working from home? I I think it would be the same tips when you go into the office. I think what happens is when people work from home um, and it's out of the ordinary of what they're used to, they like cuddle up in bed with their dog and their, you know, their computer on their lap. And it's like, that is a recipe for disaster. You want to like have your schedule, get it together the day before, the week before, know exactly what you're working on. You may not have, you know, the meetings that you used to have, but you still want to stay on track with what you have to get done. Um, I don't dress up as if I'm going to work. So I'm not about to tell people to like put on pants or normal clothes, but you definitely want to have like your space where you feel like you can get the wheels turning and you, you can think at max capacity. And generally speaking, if you're in your living room and you have a family there that's there as well, or in your bed, you're not going to get as much done. So that's my biggest thing is create a space and stay, create your own schedule. If you think about it, it really does kind of tie into branding your own personal brand. If you're working from bed and, you know, I, I can't tell you, I've been on a bunch of calls with freelancers and just different people where it's very obvious that they're working from bed (laughs) and it's like, okay, you know, this isn't exactly the best impression. So you want to think about these things. And also I just feel better when I even, sometimes I will get a little bit dressed up and it kind of like changes your mode. So. Yeah. And I worked when I, when I had a quote unquote real job, it was an, an ad agency. So I was wearing leggings or, you know, not dressing up there either. So not much has changed in that regard. Yeah. Well, so today you have a business called Biz and Booze, which I think is very interesting, or one of your brands is Biz and Booze. And, yeah. and, and we're going to talk about branding, but before we get into it, just tell us, how did you, what's your journey? How did you find yourself where you are today and, and teaching other other people how to create a brand or start a business. And I love the name Biz and Booze, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to really attract my people <laughs> and not attract my not so much people. Um, well, I'll keep this short because I really want to get into things that the users can take and run with to build their own business or, or develop their own brand. Um, so I was a former online strategy exec in the corporate world or actually the agency world. And I, my role there was to develop online marketing strategies to 
build and grow, you know, businesses of all sizes. Now, like you said, I run my own online education and consulting business. And my mission is to really simplify and accelerate the path of small business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs as they start, grow, and scale their businesses. So I have My Biz You, which is an online university that literally takes you through growing your business online. And it's actually a monthly membership where I am your personal consultant. It's a community. Um, and that is open opening I January. Don't have the exact date in January, but January is when that opens. And I have a startup program that is a part of that for people that are new entrepreneurs. So people that don't have a business yet, they want to have one. You know, when I started out, I was like, oh my God, like, what do you do? Where do you start? What's important? What's not important? It's literally a step-by-step -step blueprint for you to get your business up and launched within six weeks, even if you don't even know what business you're going to start when you go into it. Super excited about that. And then I have my um, Biz and Booth. Uh, it's a video series and podcast. It comes out every Wednesday and it's basically like a modern take on biz school for entrepreneurs and small business owners that it's served up as a happy hour. So we're drinking and it's fun and it's something where you can learn and still enjoy it. I think when I was evaluating you know, the landscape when I jumped into it, everyone was very business profesh and very serious. And I was trying to figure out, okay, like who are the people and the brands that I spend my valuable time listening to, watching, reading. And what I quickly realized what it is, it had nothing to do with the game that they were spewing at me, the knowledge that they were giving me, how much I walked away with. It had to do with, is this someone or is, is this a brand that I would love to have a happy hour with? And so that's kind of what spurred it for me because I want, I, I realized that what I enjoyed, you know, might call it my me search, what I really enjoyed were people that were having fun and people that I enjoyed their delivery and, and how they talked about things, not just what they were talking about. So from the beginning, I really wanted to make that a priority for my own business. And I wanted to create an environment and content that people would not only learn a lot from, they'd be able to apply to their businesses and make more money, save more time, whatever it was, um, but also enjoy that time that was spent with me. So that's kind of, that's the whole background. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of um, a little bit of um, Hoda and Kathy Lee or Hoda. Oh whoever. yeah. Yeah. Girl. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I really like that concept a lot. Like I really, you know, being invited to, let's just say do a webinar or something where it's just like one person talking to, you know, however many people, it's just not as interactive versus, you know, being able to, you know, have a little bit of like just joking and, and fun and, and booze too. A glass yeah. of wine always helps I break mean, the ice. I'm not an alcoholic or promoting <laughs> it, but to me, like when you think of happy hour, like that is at the end of the day, the end of your work day, like that's when you, you know, hang up your hat and the real party starts. Like your life begins now. It's five o'clock. It's happy hour. The fun starts. And I hated that separation. And when I started my own business, I really, I really do think you can work hard, play hard. And I wanted to prove that that can happen and, and make that, share that with other people so that they could realize that, you know, if you're, if you own your own business, if you are starting your own business, you got into that likely because you wanted to have a better life or create something that made you happy. And so those are my happy hour people, you know? And so I, that's really what it's about. It's about enjoying what you do. Not as much about the alcohol, but I'm yeah. not going to lie. I love myself a drink. So yeah. it made sense for me. Yeah. We should have, we should have brought wine today. I don't know what we were thinking. I actually do have wine here because <laughs> okay. I, was, I was feeling it earlier. So don't, okay. don't you worry. Yeah. I have, I have, I have my virtual wine, but you know, it makes me think of, um, I was actually listening to Stephen Kotler. He, um, he's like, kind of the the guru of flow and getting into your flow state but he was talking about having um having your own business and 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 retaining information and 
and it, he was just stressing the importance of basically like if you when you're passionate about something your brain registers that information much e more easily and you get into a flow state everything comes natural but if you're trying to do something that you don't love like if you took a class that you don't love or you're working for a company you don't love or a job you don't love like everything is so much harder you're it's, it's you're learning things it's it's coming 10 times harder so i kind of I, I feel like what you're saying is very similar yeah that, no it, it work feels like work when you're not enjoying it yeah um and not just in your time with it but like what it is you actually choose to to do like what your business is and you know i just mentioned i was filming today i because i'm launching the startup program and part of that is really figuring out like how do you find your calling like how do you find what it is that you were meant to do and and what is the perfect business for you to even start and i know the majority of your listeners already have a business but sometimes they stop and reflect and they're like well why did i get into this in the first place like they lost that intangible and and so i talk about this framework that i developed that allows you to identify not just okay what are you good at and what do you love like that's standard, but people often say, okay, when you're starting a business, you really have to start with the user and the audience and you have to figure out, okay, what is the gap that you're filling? Like, what's the problem they have that needs to be solved? You got to start there. It's about your people. And they're not completely wrong, but you most definitely don't ever want to start there because it's about you first and foremost. If you starting with the user that will help you come up with a great business idea that won't help you come up with your great business and if you're not able to execute against the business that you have then the game it's game over so you have to start with not only just what what you're good at and what you love but you really have to think about okay what do i what do i want like externally and internally like what, what do I want financially? What do I want in terms of the type of business I have, how it runs, how it functions, the team I have, um, how we're marketing, how we're growing and internally, like, but what is really driving me to start my own business? Like, why do I have this business? And, and if you lose that, even if you even if your business is something you love, anything you love, if you're doing it every day, all day, you're going to get worn out. And so it's more than that. And, and it's really important that you, when, if you're at the beginning of your journey, when you start a business that you find that, and if you have one that you don't let it go, like you've got to make sure you go back and really remember why you started it in the first place. Um, I don't want to bring up Simon Sinek because everyone knows him, you know, for, for, you know, creating that whole concept of your why. Um, but it is similar to that in that you know, what inspires you, what motivates you. And, you know, people are often afraid when it ends up being something slightly selfish, you know, and it's like, no, that's okay. Yeah. Because perfect business is the joining of something that gives you what you want and gives your audience what they want. And there's nothing wrong with that. So you could um, almost say that when you do your formula that you're lining up, like that you're reviewing right now, that yeah it's almost a form of self care because you're improving your quality of life because you're doing what you love. Yeah. Hashtag self care. It's not selfish. <laughs> <laughs> Put your face mask on first. Before yeah. You yeah. I mean, it all goes back to that. You got to Don't be, don't be shy about making yourself a priority in your business because you're not able to help other people if you're not. So let's talk here. about, Definitely. Let's talk about the importance of branding. Before we get into that, what are what are some examples of brands that you just, you know, you think are just hitting it out of the ballpark, like doing an amazing job? Like, you know, Apple comes to mind, Starbucks comes to mind, you know, those brands are, you know, everyday household names that people just thrive on their branding. Why is that? Yeah. Everything that a brand has that is memorable like those, like the Apples and the Teslas now. Like what, what makes them perfect is kind of the, the same concept, the same reason why I believe Biz and Booze is so amazing is because you're going to, you're true to the core of your brand and your why, and you're not afraid to repel people that don't make sense for your audience. Like 
if I was afraid to talk about booze and drinking, then I wouldn't attract the people that are in the happy hours. You know what I mean? Like you got to take a stand for something like, you know, with Apple, it was design and great design. And there are millions of people in the world that could give two craps about what a phone looks like, that they want it to be cool or they want it to like work well, blah, blah, blah. But then they, they unveiled this whole world of people that like really value great aesthetic. And like the fact that people went nuts over these boxes they came into, like they took a stand for who they believed was right for their business. And I think that's what really makes the best brands stand out is focusing on your people, repelling the people that you're okay with letting go with and not getting business from. Definitely. So talk us through the, the importance of branding. Why is it so important? And coming from a public relations standpoint, I mean, that's half the battle. When we get a client that wants to work with us, it's, it's okay if they're, you know, a small, just starting out startup brand, but they have to have good branding and that helps yeah. so much in the public relations process. So what are those steps? What are, what are the, what's it, why is branding so important? Yeah. So, I mean, you don't, you don't need a brand. Okay. Like, and I know that's going to be, get a lot of people's panties in a bunch, but you do not need a brand if you are a hundred percent okay with competing on price. Like there is very few products or services out there that are complete differentiable, differentiable. Yeah. <laughs> differentiable, <laughs> whatever that are you truly unique and that a, a, at the average user can understand that uniqueness. If you have both of those things, then like your product itself, like what you are selling, then you, know, you don't need a brand. Nobody has that though. Like we are in such a saturated market, such a noisy market. And if you want to be able to sell what you are offering, whatever that is, without competing on price and without um, getting lost in that noise, you need a brand. Like my, going back to my example for my own business, I am, a, I am the, as a marketing consultant or, you know, edu creating, you know, an online experience, online courses and memberships for people to market their business. Like like I'm competing with Gary V. You know what I mean? Like the and there and everyone in their their mom is doing it. I knew going into that that I was going to need to put my own spin on it, not just in what I was offering, making sure that was unique. That's table stakes, but in my my brand and how I positioned that and how I positioned myself. Since I am in a situation where I am a personal brand, not all businesses have personal brands, but same principles apply because I needed to get people's attention and so that they could even, they would even want to look at my, my product and realize that it's different. So, I mean, I can't talk enough about how important it is if you, if you want to um, really be able to attract the right audience without selling out or going cheap. And what are some of the proactive steps that you can take in branding because I mean, isn't it true that if you don't take proactive steps and you don't pay attention to your branding, that your customers or your, your clients are going to create your, the brand for you. They're going to define your brand. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I want to, I'll talk through some of the key steps that I took to get to where I am and what I recommend for a lot of my students too, as well. Um, before we get in that, to that too, I like that you said that, like, cause if you don't create your own brand, people in their minds will create what their perception of your brand is. And that goes, that also sh shows to the fact that your brand isn't just the look, it's how you make people feel. So, um, that can come across in your brand look and feel like in your colors and your fonts and that type of stuff. But that is lowest on the totem pole of what's really important with your branding, it's your, your voice, your tone, your messaging, the content that you're putting out and how it's delivered. Um, but what, here's what I would say is 
step one is truly understand your competition. We all have it no matter what market we are in. So you wanna find and research other uh, experts or other people that are competing against, um, the, you know, keep competing for the attention of the same audience that you were trying to compete for. Who are the big players? What makes them stand out? What makes them successful? What are they doing well that you can emulate? What are they doing not so well that you can learn from? And how are they different or similar to your business? And once you have an understanding of who's out there and how they position themselves, use your knowledge of those in the category to help you define how you are going to stand out. You're going to wanna to map out what makes you unique and more importantly, what makes you better. And not just what makes your offer better, but what, what, why would they, when people buy, people love, like you know that saying, people love to buy, they don't love to be sold to. People love to buy from brands that represent who they want to be and, and what they want to be, the, what they stand for. So, you know, you, you, you want to make sure that you're doing that for your brand as well as your, your offer. Once you do that, step two would be to really get inspiration outside of your niche. Most small business owners, they're in a quote unquote, and they'll admit it themselves, quote unquote, boring category. And the people that they're competing with are not exactly rock stars in branding themselves. So they're not going to learn a lot about what to do. They're going to learn a lot about a lot what not to do. They're not going to learn a lot about what to do by their direct competitors. So by looking outside of your niche, then you are able to really get the best inspiration for what can make you unique and better. And it's a lot easier to mimic uh, what or model, not copy, model what people are doing outside of your industry. When you do it in your industry, it's going to come to life in a completely unique way. So even though you are modeling someone else, when it's outside of your industry, it's going to, it's, it's going to be much more true to you and much more unique. So that would be the second step. Research brands, influencers, experts, whoever in other industries you know what the best thing is? If you just Google like top startups of 2020, that's where you're going to find like the coolest brands are these startups. And they have different, lots of different startup lists, but just go, go through, they, each of them link to all their sites, like go through their sites, see how they're designing their sites, how they're representing their brand, how they're doing their logo, like how they're welcoming people into their world. When you get to the homepage of their site, like you're going to, get so much inspiration from that. Uh, and then once you do that, I would, the step three would be making sure you really understand your audience. So like I said, although your brand needs to be true to you, if it doesn't connect to those that you're looking to reach, it's not going to serve your business. So like if I, if I turn biz and booze into like, a, like we're all wasted, like, <laughs> <laughs> My target audience, the small business owner, entrepreneurs are going to be like, Laura, that's irresponsible. I'm here. I like, I need to get stuff done. So like, I have to have a balance where it's like, okay, we're having fun, but I'm not getting slammed on these. <laughs> I'm like actually teaching you really, really valuable information that can make you a lot of money in your business. So you've got to be not saying like, if it didn't matter, I'd be drunk, but just that was probably a bad example, but just, you, you've got to make sure that it's true to you yet still something that your audience is going to be really attracted to so you need to make sure that you know before you get too far down this path that you understand who that is like who are you providing value to what are they like what is the current situation they are in you know their pain points their problems all those normal questions how do they feel and really map that out and you know fit that those puzzle pieces together so it's almost like you're saying part of the branding process is putting together your one to two or three personas of who you're targeting, where you have to have that. If the more you have that actually flushed out, mm -hmm. um, the easier it's going to be to develop your branding. Absolutely. Not only will it be easier, but it will be a lot more on point. Yeah. Because you're, you know, you have that, that, 
reference point as you're really honing in on what that is. Um, so step four, and speaking of honing in on what that is, step four helps you do that. So you wanna identify then your brand characteristics. So brand characteristics are adjectives that best describe your brand's character. So how you want your target audience to perceive you, to feel when they interact with you. Is your personal brand inspirational? Is it honest? Is it glamorous? Is it funny? Is it quirky? Is it zen or something completely different? And you kind of have to figure out, okay, what are the adjectives? Like pick like five or six adjectives that really represent your brand. Like for my brand, for example, it would be fun, entertaining, educational, upbeat, lighthearted, and helpful. So figure out what those are for you and write those out. And to help with this, I actually, and we haven't talked about this yet, I put together for your listeners a free workbook that goes through the steps that we're going through. And it also includes a list of over 200 brand adjectives that you can use and pick from as you're defining your own brand personality. And they can get that at lauramarks.com slash brand. And that's Laura Mark with a Z. Um, so definitely get that if you guys are following along and you really want to figure out like what your um, brand characteristics are and if you want help defining your target audience, everything's all in there. And if you're not taking notes, we'll put this in the show notes. We'll put a, a link to to this um, to this URL so that you can download this. This is awesome. I can't wait to to read all of the the adjectives and brainstorm for even the buyer group and some of our clients. So it's it's very helpful. And uh, I would when we're when we start working with clients, a lot of times they're missing um, the personas or these steps that you're outlining. You know, I don't think that a lot of um, businesses, you, you know, no matter what the size, actually, when they're, let's say, creating their branding for their logo identity, are they handing the designer all of these, um, all of this information? Typically not. I mean, typically, like, this isn't, this, this, some of these steps are, are skipped, and that's going to, in the long run, that hurts a brand. Right. And they're either skipped for one of two reasons. Either you think it's fluff, which been there. So no judgment, like the idea of personas, like I literally was like, what a waste of time. But I mean, knowing what I know now, like it is one of the most important critical components of developing your brand. Um, and then the other thing is maybe you don't know how to get, it's hard. It's, you know, it's very um, subjective and it's not, it, it's not as tangible always, the things you're trying to get across as a brand. They're not as tangible. It's like when you know someone, for example, you have a picture of who they are in your mind. It'd be hard to fully explain who that person is, somebody else. And the, it goes the same way with brands and what you want your brand to be. But going back to what I said and like Googling top startups, like if you go, if you do say have an agency that you work with and you're trying to get them to help you with your brand and they're missing the mark or you want to give them more direction, that will help when you see, when you can give that like, Hey, I, this part of this brand, like I really want to capture that in our own. You know what I mean? It's, and again, it's not copying, it's really modeling and taking inspiration from other brands out there that you admire. And, I, and that's a hundred percent acceptable while you, when you develop your brand. And brands evolve. It's not written in stone. When you start, a brand, you can evolve as your business expands and, yeah. and grows and different interpretations, you know, happen. And, you know, yes. if you look at the history of just, let's say even Apple or Coca-Cola in Starbucks. I mean, if you look at their, their branding from the time they started until now, it's evolved and modernized. So I think that's a, you know, people can get stuck in, it has to be perfect. Yeah. And you have yeah. to spend a lot of money to do it. I think that's oh, another gosh. misconception. I spent $5 on Fiverr for my logo and I'm still using it. You know what I mean? Like people, it's just like websites where it can very easily be a time and money suck if you don't realize what's important and what's not. And you also aren't accepting of the fact that it can change and evolve just the way people change and evolve. And when you're a small business owner, especially if you're a newer small business owner, you're likely, if you're successful, you're likely pretty niche 
in who you're going after and what you're offering. But as you grow, both those things expand. What you offer more things, you solve more problems, you reach out to more people. And, and with that, it's impossible not to have some sort of evolution of your brand. And, and depending on what type of business you are, as you age, your audience ages, you know? So I remember when I started Biz and Booze, I was like, well, wait, when I'm 50, uh, <laughs> I'm still going to be drinking on camera. And I was like, whatever, I can't worry about that far, that far ahead because my audience will evolve, you know, with me, hopefully. And by then I'm probably not going to be drinking on camera. I'll be doing something else. But like, but that didn't mean I didn't want to pursue that idea because it's right for right now. You know what I mean? So yeah, totally understand that things can change and, and you don't, it's not like the old school days where it's like once print is out <laughs> like mm -hmm. you can't change it like you can change anything immediately online yeah and you know, it's really easy doing your show in virtual reality and meeting avatar to avatar instead of like oh, yeah. video or audio so you yeah. won't be able to drink in virtual reality i well i know i mean <laughs> you'll have virtual drinks or something yeah i'm sure there will be some something like that what are some other misconceptions and myths when it comes to branding like you have to pay you know a lot of money for a logo or what, what else is there that you can, or, or yeah. what's, what's completely out to, I want to talk about. Uh, I personally, and I, I, I wouldn't spend all your time on a website. Okay. And this is crazy for me to say, because I came to the world of websites. I've, I've helped build hundreds of websites. That was like my shtick. And people, these brands would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars on these things. It'd take months to get up. And when you're a new brand, or, or, or an old brand, like you want to represent yourself in the best light. And so you think that means a big website, but in reality, everyone should have a one page website, maybe two, if they have a blog, like, and it shouldn't be a place where you throw all of your content on it. It should be you should think about it as if someone's walking into your brick and mortar or walking or calling you up for the first time, like, or at, you're at a party and you run into somebody that is your perfect customer. Like, what is the first thing that you want to get across to them and that you want them to do? And that should be the only focus of your website. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's like, 15 seconds, like think of a tweet, uh, your first section of your site, it should be less than a tweet saying what you do and who you do it for and, and why it's unique. They should be able to within seconds understand what that is. And it should have a call to action. Like, hey, because when people are coming to your homepage, it's, they're usually new people, you know? And so you want to say, here is your first step that you should take with my business and get rid of all that other, other noise. Um, so yeah, websites, oh, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, and I think the, the whole like mood board and like brand pa color palette and fonts and typography, it's like, those things are, obviously they have a place, but it's not something that you should be spending a ton of money in and all, all these, these weeks and months on, um, like I said, go, go get, get something done on Fiverr or hire a freelancer. If you are trying to save money there, really focus on spending the real value of spending that type of money is actually getting in front of your target audience. Like, so you can actually have them come to your website, you know, not creating this spectacle that no one sees. So I think that's probably the biggest distraction that people have when it comes to branding or it comes to the representation of their business online. Um, so I would say, forget about those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I was doing an interview talking about just small businesses and, and, and local branding. And one of the questions was similar. And I mean, one of the you know, one of the things I said was you actually don't even need to have a website to start a business. You can start your business on Instagram first yeah. and, and get your website going, you know, while, but you can instantly start uh, an Instagram account and at least, you know, 
that could be your storefront. Yeah. That could be your, your mini website, your microsite. So and I can evolve like that without calling yeah. a skill developer. Yeah. And you're doing live video and you know, all these things that you just have at your fingertips at, basically for free. It's your time to put into it, but you know, that's where you could start. Yeah. And another suggestion, I actually just relaunched my website and I did it well, the homepage I did all by myself. I am not a developer. I'm not a designer. I'm a self-taught designer now. Um, and I use this program called lead pages. It's L E A D pages. Maybe we can put that in the show notes yeah. too. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to lauramarks.com slash lead pages. I tell you all about it and why I love it, but I love them because they have pre-designed templates that you can use and then you can customize, customize the colors, customize the fonts, add in your imagery, add in your messaging, and you have a website. You could literally get a website up in a day and you don't need a developer, you don't need to worry about all of that. And then I use them for my landing pages as well. So, you know, for example, when you go to lauramarks.com slash brand to snag this workbook, like that landing page was built with lead pages and I literally got it up and out by using one of the templates in a few hours. So anything you can do to dodge having to pull in more and more people to help with your website, the better. And it also gives you more flexibility to be able to edit. Obviously there are things that you, like if you have a blog, like my blogs on WordPress and I use a developer for that, but like when it comes to basic pages or, or having a page and maybe a form contact form, like that can all be done using lead pages without any design or development experience. So one of my favorite tools that I use for my business. Awesome. What are some tips you can give or social PR secrets you can give to, um, for ongoing brand awareness? So what, what can we do on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis that's helping our branding? Oh, a lot. Well, first create consistent content, obviously. <laughs> um, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to do every single week for every single brand. Um, so you really have to identify like if you are in a highly, highly competitive market and you have a long lead time for a purchase, then you absolutely need to be creating consistent content every single week. If you have like a lower lead time, like a lower, a smaller, shorter sales cycle, um, it's not as necessary to create content that often. You still want to create content, but you aren't you aren't required to be whipping it out that much. And you want to focus on content that not only represent, that not only gets your brand voice out. So people, when consuming that content, they can feel and, and get inspired by what your brand is and understand what that is. But it also needs to inform them or educate them in some way and stir desire for your core offer. So whatever it is you are trying to sell them, again, if it's a longer lead cycle, you want content that is going to build that need for what you're selling them. So in a way it's selling to them without them even feeling like they're being sold to because you're educating them or informing them about something that at the end of the day will enlighten them to how badly they need what it is you're offering. So that would be my first recommendation. Um, another thing is to identify what I call brand tangibles. Um, so in addition, I kind of talked about um, adjectives. So tangibles are things that are aspects of your brand personality. So, so if I'm a, I'm a personal brand. So for me, for example, it would be obviously online marketing and entrepreneurship, happy hours, dad jokes, <laughs> my <laughs> family, dogs, reality TV. I talk a lot about the real housewives, um, mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so every time somebody sits down and watches real housewives, they're like, hmm, pops in their head. Like Laura, like Laura's obsessed with Real Housewives. That chick is funny. You know what I mean? Like, or that brand, um, really represents 
that and it's something that I see in my everyday life and it makes me think about that brand. So you want to think about what are things that people have connection points with in their own lives that are, that are tangible, like real things. And if you as a brand can connect yourself to those things, then, and, and talk about those types of things in your content, then when they see those things, they think of you. So they don't need to see my video to get exposed to me. They can turn on the TV or grab a cocktail or have a happy hour and they think of me, you know? So you have to kind of figure out what can those tangible elements be for your brand that you can build that, the, that connection to. I like that a lot. So speaking of tangible, how important are business cards today? I've never used one personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually they're not important at all today because we should be six feet apart. Right. So no, I, I think that one page website is your, is your business quote unquote business card. Um, and getting a URL that's easy to rattle off that they can remember. Like I, like I have lauramarks.com. I also have bizandboost.com. So it's like you, when you're talking to someone, I can just be like, just go to bizandboost.com. It's going to be right there. Like, um, like on the homepage of bizandboost.com of like, if I'm uh, promoting a new episode, all I have to say is go to bizandboost.com because right when they get there, it's going to be the last episode of bizandboost. So you want to think about how, what are some vanity domains that you can leverage for different, um, types of people that you would give a business card to because someone may be completely a, di a completely different target audience or persona than somebody else you may send them to a different landing page you may send you know persona a to floormarks.com you may send persona b to bizandboost.com or something like that i think just with the digital world that we're in and the ability to um send people to an experience that's a lot more engaging and can guide them in the direction you want to go as opposed to just here is my name and number um you're gonna go, you're gonna go a lot farther COVID aside <laughs> yeah yeah no definitely um just one example that I think is kind of cool is like a little bit of old school coming back you know to to marketing so this podcast that I um I listen to a lot hustle and flow chart what they do is they um they have a monthly newsletter that's basically a combination of their show notes of the month that they print out very detailed um, into this called it Evergreen newsletter that I subscribe to. I pay $15 a month for, but I kind of like it because like nobody really does print newsletters anymore. And so you're not, that's not like a cluttered space like it used to be. And I ah. you know, something about like just being, having something tangible and physical to read. So I think that there might be some old school things like that coming back. Like for example, the press release we used to mail to all the journalists, like nobody gets mail anymore, but I don't know if I would mail a press release, but mailing and, and printed materials, I think in some way are, are having um, somewhat of a comeback. I mean, I'm not talking about like car dealerships and things like that, but. <laughs> no, I a hundred percent agree. And I actually have a really good example of one. So there's a, I guess he was kind of a competitor of mine, but he's a lot, a lot bigger in um, the online membership space. So if you have a business that you want to develop recurring revenue in, he's your dude. His name's Stu McLaren and his program helps you um, put a membership inside your business model. So if you in the past were just getting business by selling one-off products if you, or services, if you cre you can create a membership or subscription model around it and put your business get a new revenue st stream coming in, and um, ha and it be more affordable to your to your customers your clients and then be able to provide value to them ongoing and the payout ends up being a lot better for you anyways because if you think about you know the fifteen dollars a month that adds up so anyways his program is called Tribe and he as a part of his program. I, I took it last year and this year. He surprises you, and, and his program's great, like it's already a great program, but he surprises you with these gift boxes 
and you are just like blown away. Like they come in the mail, you open, like it's, it's like an Apple situation where it's like so cool looking, but it's like fun. Like he's kind of, he's a goofy guy and it's like fun stuff. So it's like bright colors. You open it up, confetti flies out. And then it's like all this cute little welcome note that's super creative. And like he even, um, you know, those do rag things, um, it was during mid COVID when mm -hmm. I got my box and he had one that was branded, a brand of branded do rag. Is do rag? Not, yeah. Do rag. It's the thing that you wear yeah. over your mask that is kind yeah. of like a neck thing. That yeah. You level over. Yeah. yeah. Um, which apparently now I'm hearing is worse than masks, but regardless. Um, so he, he had that fully branded. It was made total sense. And he had like a little keychain thing. And I'm like, this is genius. Like, he has exceeded my expectations. I did not expect that that was coming and it was unique. It wasn't just like, like you said, a little car dealership, like newsletter or postcard. It was like a cool thing. And that, the, that gift box could not have cost him more than $10 to put together um, because he was producing it at scale. But there are different things like that that you can do that can really excite people about your brand and bring your brand to life in a, an environment where you're not competing the way you would online or in social. So I, I totally agree. You just got to be creative about it. It has to represent you and your brand well. Definitely. So we're um, actually have a couple more minutes. I just wanted to find, so you mentioned some, some resources that you use that you get inspiration. What are some maybe podcasts, other podcasts or blogs or, you know, where do you turn to for inspiration and for ideas and whether it's from an entrepreneurship standpoint or branding? I love, love, love Amy Porterfield. She's I do one too. of my yeah. faves. She's just so sweet. Um, she's, she's just amazing. She talks about all things online marketing, um, but her true focus is on online business owners and uh, how to create a, a course to sell as an extension of your business just as Stu McLaren is another one I'm obsessed with him he's so fun funny like he just he cracks me up um so again he's entertaining so I enjoy listening to his stuff because he knows what he's talking about I come away with good nuggets but I'm also like energized because this guy has energy for days um so Stu McLaren would be another one um I mean, Tony Robbins is, you know, an, an idol in this whole space. So I would say he's a good one. If you're looking for Instagram uh, help, Jasmine Starr is one of my faves. She's really, really amazing at what she does on Instagram. And she has a program that is amazing for small business owners that just don't have the time to churn out consistent social content. Um, so she's really great. Those are the big ones though. Yeah, Amy, those are great sources. Amy, Stu, and Jasmine. Yeah, I love Amy too. And I mean, I'm definitely obsessed with Tony Robbins, like forever. Yeah. Like I've done his courses so many times and go, it's so cool because you keep my journal and go back and look like I actually accomplished things that I forgot that I even put in the journal that were goals, you know, and like that is one the year. Of, yeah, and that is the beauty of writing it down. Because then yeah. I think we as people, especially we as business owners, we we were like, oh, I wish I was farther. I wish I was moving faster. But if you really sat down and you're like, look at how far you've come and you reflect on that, it really helps you put into perspective how much you have accomplished as opposed to constantly trying to keep up with all the things you want to do. You mentioned social content. So I just have one quick question on that. So I was looking at your website and your Instagram feed is at the bottom of your website, which is beautiful. And like how... It's and it's all very on point with your brand, of course. <laughs> uh, but 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 when it comes to social content, and I'm maybe like talking more about Instagram and you know the whole. It used to be like everybody is so obsessed about the aesthetic and like how everything went on the grid has to kind of like fall into place. And you know, clients will be like, "Well, that has to be on that that content isn't that isn't on brand." But you know, how on brand does the social content need to be before all of a sudden it looks like a commercial? Well, how do you, how do you differentiate? Oh yeah. Um, Instagram is, uh, I think in 2018, it really peaked in, um, that uniformity that like super stylist 
holistic brand photographer, like the people with like all the same filters on their feed and everyone taken by a professional photographer, that's slingshotting back. At this point in 2020, people are a lot more interested in the real time candid moments as well as designed graphics like quotes and graphics that catch their eye um so i to me it's about your post caption over anything and a, an image that's going to get their attention if you have those two things you got to throw all that other never think about how your grid looks because very few people are checking out your grid other than you every five seconds so it's, mm -hmm. it's really how your post each individual post appears in the feed and are you capturing attention for people to slow their roll slow their scroll, <laughs> slow their, scroll. <laughs> slow their scroll and hopefully engage with it well from a branding standpoint too um larger brands more so are very concerned about real time and doing things quickly because of you know it's less control and i mean what we tell our clients is that i mean they either they have to get in or they're going to lose out and they can't yeah. overanalyze and you know the real time stuff is where it's at right now absolutely and it's more authentic it's more relevant and therefore it's going to get pe more people's attention you can absolutely do your thing planning ahead as best you can but in anything in life god laughs at a plan like you got <laughs> you got to be willing to pivot and to put something out that may not be perfect, but you know is on point for whatever the immediacy is that required, that made you want to put it out in the first place. Laura, this has been so awesome. So let's just um, one more time talk about your giveaway, the, the URL and where all the different U the websites that we can find you and follow you. Yeah, so you can get the brand workbook. It has a few more steps we didn't cover and walks you through everything I did at lauramarks.com slash brand. And that's Laura Mark with a Z. And um, you can find me at Laura Marks everywhere. Um, I'm the most active on Instagram. You can find me at Laura Marks. And uh, if you want to check out my site, it's lauramarks.com. Great. And any last words of wisdom that you want to share? A favorite quote? Yeah. I mean, enjoy the ride. Like we get busy we get in our worlds we're trying to achieve all of our big goals and grow our businesses but if at the end of the day if we're not remembering to just enjoy it then it's none of it's worth it so just have fun with what you're doing thank you so much i love it totally agree namaste and i <laughs> yes 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 um hope to have you back again and talk more about branding and whatever the next chapter is when you launch your class in in january we can talk about yes it oh yeah that's another thing people can check out is my biz you my biz you .com. sounds awesome thank join you so my much. Biz you join my .com. excuse me We'll put it in I the show notes. you.com is some um, Chinese website. You don't want to go there. It's join, <laughs> join my biz you .com. <laughs> We will also put that in the show notes. So thank you awesome. so much. So great talking to you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Social PR Secrets. If you like what you heard, check out the book on Amazon or follow our blog at socialprsecrets.com. This episode was sponsored by The Buyer Group, a social PR agency striving to keep our balance in the digital world, practicing public relations, social media, and search marketing, while occasionally drinking a glass of wine or two for the best creativity and results. Thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to get a free chapter of Social PR Secrets, go to socialprsecrets.com slash free.